Hello again and welcome to Rep TV. I'm your co-host Paul Merchan and sitting to my far left is the rep man himself, Steve Cody. And we'd like to welcome again Professor David Redloss, political science professor from Rutgers University. Welcome again. Thanks. So uh, we're going to pick up on part two of our discussion on the negative rhetoric that's permeating the current election campaign. And we talked a little bit about this in the previous segment, Professor, but uh, we want to know exactly how this negative rhetoric will affect voter turnout. Uh, will more people come out as a result of the mudslinging? Will less people come out? What do you think is going to happen? I don't know. And I say it that way because I, I ground a lot of this from the research standpoint as a political scientist. And the political science research on negativity and turnout is incredibly muddled. Mm. Right? There are plenty of examples where negative campaigns have generated high turnout. Mm. There are other examples where negative campaigns have suppressed turnout. Mm. Um, Part of it simply has to do with there's a, a connection between the level of negativity and the competitiveness of an election. Mm -hmm. So when the election is not particularly competitive, you won't see as much negativity, you won't see as much anything, right? right? right. And the media certainly won't cover it the same way. But when an election is highly competitive, generally the, the, the number of attacks go up, the coverage of those attacks go up. Mm -hmm. But turnout often goes up mm. in a competitive election rather than down, even with negativity. Got it. So this is a competitive election, so we're likely seeing some good turnout then. I, you know, I think it's a little tough in some sense. One yeah. thing to keep in mind is that this is not actually a national election. The presidential election is fought state by state. Mm -hmm. The large majority of American states are non-competitive. Mm -hmm. So New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, right? You're not going to see a lot of the campaign in these states. On the other hand, if you went out to Iowa, as small as it is, mm -hmm. you know, you will see it on TV, you'll see it in the media, you'll right. even see the candidates. So we could have this interesting environment where some states have increased turnout mm -hmm. and lots of states have decreased turnout. All right. So let's turn back to my favorite candidate. Uh, not my favorite candidate, but um, uh, whatever. <laughs> the Donald. The Donald. Okay. So. Um, is there going to come a point where he's just gone too far in those tweets where where the conservative Republican base steps in and says, you either stop this or we're going to, you know, put Mitt, Pitt, right. uh, Mitt Romney up right. as a separate candidate. Can he go too far to completely alienate the Republican base? Well, he's working on it, <laughs> right? And, I, and he's working on it partly because of the uniquely personal nature of the way he attacks yes. about everything. One clear thing in our research on negativity is that personal attacks are problematic, mm -hmm. and especially attacks on a candidate's family, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. happens surprisingly, and they almost always rebound. So he starts by being very unusual in the personal nature of what he does. He's the Twitter candidate, so we've, we're in a very different world than we've been in before. But you could argue he's already gone too far in the sense of you look at people who won't endorse him or uh, your Republicans who are actively speaking against him. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a base, right? There is a Republican base in this two-party system that he's unlikely to go below. Let's say 40 to 42 percent of the vote, no matter how outrageous he gets. The real problem for him is the more outrageous he gets, the less likely he's going to grab the middle. Yeah, I've, I've read various reports that said, should he win, he will fundamentally change the core values of the Republican Party, and yet there are those that are such strong adherents to those policies and, and points of view. Would that create a third party? Yeah. It's very difficult to create a third party and to, to, to actually get it on the ballot to create a systematic development of this simply because to use Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump's word, the system is rigged in a sense to the two-party <laughs> sure. system, yeah, sure. right? And so the rules are tough to build a new party. But it would not surprise me to see a stronger breakaway effort, the libertarian ticket, Gary Johnson, a yes. former Republican mm -hmm. governor, grab much more attention. Um, if Trump were to win, I, I think we throw out 
everything we think we know anyway, Just right? Yeah. And, <laughs> and we start over. Mm -hmm. um, if he loses, which I think is certainly more probable at the moment, the Republican Party is likely to continue some internal battling, but in an ironic way, maybe, it may bring them back together, mm -hmm. having Trump lose and the leadership saying, now nah, we've got to figure out where we're going. Yeah, right? we are. Um, well, you touched on the Libertarian <clears throat> Party before. I've read a few reports saying that if they do garner, say, three or four percent of the vote, it'll come out of Hillary's total. Do you agree with that? Um, I, <laughs> it's really difficult to say where the where folks come from who go off into either, you know, somewhere other than the two parties. Mm -hmm. um, um, typically, we suggest the Libertarians will draw from the right and from Republicans, and the Green Party will draw from the left from mm -hmm. potential Democrats. Mm -hmm. um, you will see a lot of polling that's going to show third party candidates like either Libertarians or the Greens, you know, in the upper single digits, maybe even into the double digits. And then we'll get close to election day and a lot of that will fade away if history is any indicator. But I should point out, history hasn't been much of an indicator so far. <laughs> Absolutely. So it's, the mudslinging, you mentioned that that's happened forever since the beginning. Is it going to get any worse? After this election cycle, it, it seems like it set a precedent, at least in our, in what we've seen. Will it get worse four years from now? I, you know, at some point, I suppose, if everything's negative, it mm -hmm. can't get any worse. Mm -hmm. um, in 2012, in the last month of the presidential campaign, um, uh, on the Romney side, virtually everything was negative. Yep. So it couldn't get more negative mm -hmm. than that because every ad being run was mm -hmm. negative. What's really funny this year is, is despite that sense that it's so negative, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of this is driven by Trump's rhetoric, um, in the run-up to the Iowa caucuses, which started the whole thing off, you know, the whole primary season off, um, there was a lot more positive advertising than we have seen in a lot of years. Most of the super PACs on the Republican side, those 17 Republican candidates, mm -hmm. were actually running positive ads because they were introducing the candidates. Right, right. So it caught me by surprise because I was expecting attack, attack, attack. Yeah, right. And instead we didn't get it, and I guess part of the reason we got Donald Trump, none of the other Republicans would attack him. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. Right? Yeah. Will it get worse? I guess it depends on your definition of worse. What worse means. Yeah. Okay. Real quick uh, question, and then we're going to turn to our yeah. amazingly large studio audience. <laughs> um, I just returned from the Middle East. I was in the Kingdom of Jordan, and they are desperately hoping that Trump doesn't win for right. obvious reasons. Right. What do you think the worldview of the United States is at the moment? I think the world probably wonders what's going on, you know, how we've gotten off track. And, mm -hmm. and I really put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have two, historically, two great parties. We have a two-party system. If we have a system in which one party is falling apart, no matter which side you're on, that's a terrible situation to be in. Mm -hmm. And I think the world's looking at this right now saying, is that happening? Is this system just destroying itself. Mm -hmm. um, I'm hopeful that that's not the case. I tend to try to look at things through a reasonably positive light, but, you know, this is unique. And I think the American voters in the end are reasonable, and I don't think we're going to see a President Trump, but if we do, our relationship with the world changes drastically. Right. Yeah. Wow. Studio audience, questions, I see. Hello. Please. Hi. Um, so you touched upon a very interesting topic, and that's foreign policy. Um, I think that, you know, both sort of parties kind of vary in their ideas of what a, a right policy would be for our country. So I'm a Zionist. I mean, that's just me being biased. But what do you think that, you know, either a Trump presidency or either a Hillary presidency, Clinton, um, would mean for, let's say, Israel and maybe even Palestine or, you know, Israel's enemies or even just the rest of the world in general? Who do you think would be sort of the best candidate to, to lead that effort? Not to mention Benghazi, but that's Yeah, no, no. And, I, and, I, and I'll tell you that. I'll, I'll, no, no, I'll tell you that this is, this is a tough question. It's, yeah. uh, I still come back to the idea that I'm not really sure what Donald Trump's policies are at this point. I mean, he, he talks about being a great friend of Israel. Israel, but he often talks about a lot of things and we're not quite sure what the base is to what he talks about. Um, both parties, both Republicans and Democrats, um, uh, uh, are 
generally supportive of Israel, generally supportive of that democracy and the, you know, the only real democracy in the Middle East. Um, but at the same time, I think there are subtle differences, and certainly Bill Clinton was trying to, you know, came fairly close actually to some kind of agreement before the end of his presidency. I, in the end, I suspect. Um, even if Donald Trump were president, the foreign policy establishment is kind of what it is, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure it would drastically change anything. I don't know if that's a positive thing or a negative thing at the yeah. moment, right? That's cool. But I don't think we're seeing dramatic changes in that. Now, that's putting aside Trump's you know, claims to stop Muslims from coming here or building a wall in Mexico or, or whatever else, right? Yeah. Those are both things I don't think actually happen in the real world. Right? <laughs> so um, Donald Trump is a candidate like I think no one's probably ever seen before. You know, we talk about his level of rhetoric and how the rules don't seem to apply to him. To what degree does this have implications for future election cycles? Or do we just have a short memory and this is normal? Because to me it seems pretty unusual. Yeah, we do sort of have a short memory anyway, right? Every election cycle seems to be, oh, this is a different one, it's unique, something happening. Trump is certainly unusual and he has in some sense through the primary process skated by without being held to account for the kinds of things he said and the kinds of things he did. But as we're moving into the general election it is changing and a general election is a very different kind of election. He needs to appeal beyond this one-third or 40 percent of the Republican Party and appeal to you know 50 percent plus of Americans generally. Because of that, the media's, I think, it's an impressionistic thing at the moment, that the media's taking a different tack already, that we're seeing a different kind of campaign, and that Trump has not adjusted to it. So the question is going to be, is this, again, does this say anything about the future, or does it in some sense ultimately just war in the future, right? Don't ever have a candidate like this again. We have to wrap up. Final question from me before Paul wraps up. Who's going to win and by how much? And by how much? All right. Well, I'm, I am going to go out on a limb because I, I find it very hard to see how Donald Trump puts together a winning coalition in the battleground states, right? There are states Republicans will win. There are states Democrats will win. Um, but what's really interesting is while the polls are close in battlegrounds like Pennsylvania and Ohio, they're surprisingly close in Georgia and Utah, places that Republicans almost certainly win. If Trump is defending places like that, he absolutely loses, there's no question about it. How much does, does Clinton win if, if my world's correct? Um, she probably wins in the 330 electoral vote range, 320, 330 wow. electoral okay. vote range. But I'm, I was like everybody else. I didn't see Donald Trump coming, so That's right. duly noted. I'll end on that point. Duly noted. Well, maybe we can have you back once the election finishes, and we'll see how your predictions pan out. Hold me to out. account. Absolutely. We always like to do that here. Morning, <laughs> morning after. No one else does. I'm always safe because no one holds you to account. That's right. Well, not, we, we not us. Here. We don't hold you accountable. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time, Professor Red Moss. It was a pleasure. Uh, for all those who are watching, make sure you put in your comments. Let us know if you have any questions, and join us again next time for. TV.